Hello everyone, I'm Travel Kai and welcome to the EDH channel. Today's video dedication is brought to you with thanks from Dan Kirch. If you'd like to support the channel as well, then you can visit Patreon and donate with the link in the description below. Failing that, a like, comment and subscribe is always appreciated. Now, let's have a look at everyone's opening hands. Decent hand for us if we can get a third land, then it's Kodama's Reach. And we're looking pretty good after that, I hope. Well, that's a really good turn one drop for the Akiri player, Rolfisto going for Sagada's Aid. And then just some tap lands for the other two. We will get down a tap land of our own in Breeding Pool. Then a Sutra Priest for the Orzov player. And a bit of ramp from Gogo, -Go, as usual. If Gogo's -Go good at anything, it's ramping. Now a third land in the next turn or two would be very good, in fact we need one next turn for that Kodama's reach. So let's just pass and keep our fingers crossed. And Akiri, Fearless Voyager, is the first commander to enter the battlefield. Burnished Heart, deciding to do a bit of ramp over the next few turns most likely, and that will gain them a life. Brofisto obviously lost a life from the Suture Priest and the Akiri entering. Alright, Temple Bell, hopefully, I was going to say, hopefully he goes for that straight away. And we don't get into a land, but we do get a Sol Ring, so we can fix our land next turn with Kodama's Reach. And they make themselves a bounce land. Alright, and there's Ancient Tomb, so... We'll... Uh, yeah, we'll make double green with this. And then we can go Ancient Tomb, make a Sol Ring with the Colourless Manor. And then, uh, I thought we might have enough for the Elemental Bomb there. Oh well, we'll just go for the Kodama's Reach. Might have been able to save myself a bit of life there, I'm not sure. Now a Dockside Extortionist coming down from the Boros player. We're against a bunch of white players, so... I uh, need to think about the fact that we might see Swords and Path. I don't think there's much of anything we're going to do about that. Probably just have to play into it. And the first equipment of the game is a Commander's Plate. Which can come in with Flash, but comes in during the main and auto-equips to Akiri. Bumps that up to a 6-6 six, six straight away. So that will have protection from our entire deck. Sword of the Animist comes down and auto-equips as well. And yeah, swinging in at us. It's likely, when you're being a Simic player, it's likely that someone's going to swing in at you and get rid of you as soon as they can, and especially if you're a Coma player. Yeah, Commander's Plate is probably one of the worst cards that we could have seen to be honest. A Soul Warden comes down for the Orzhov play, this is a Soul Sisters deck so I expect to see a lot of life gain in the form of ETBs. Leaving up three mana likely for the Burnished Heart and let's see if they want to swing in at us. Now each player drawing a card during Gogo's turn with the Temple Bell. Another land for us. Followed by more ramp in a Talisman. They do have a land to make this turn in that basic swamp. And then Transmute Artifact, that's interesting. So they'll be able to sacrifice an artifact and then take the CMC and add a bit of mana to it to search for an artifact and put it into play. And it's one of their talismans that they decide to get rid of so they can go for up to a 4 CMC artifact here. And it's Font of Mythos, so in typical Golgo fashion, going for a group hug deck. Which we already saw from the Temple Bell. Now we only need to take two more hits from Akiri and it might be that Double Strike comes down from that next turn. Pongify doesn't help us because it's got protection from our colours. So I think we might just have to try our commander here. And hopefully we get into some removal for the commander's plate. And there's still white mana held up over here so we might just see removal on it before we're able to make it indestructible. 
And even if we can make it indestructible, that's not the best thing necessarily. Because obviously indestructible gets around exile. A little bit of life gained from Mango. I think the Akiri player will swing in at us regardless. Discard the fact or fiction, the Hydroid Crisis and a land here I think. We're pretty likely to get into another land next turn I think. And then the first trigger from Coma. Everyone's got the chance to destroy it here if they are able to. Yeah, the Ozov player's holding up priority here, but decides to let it down. So we go around to the Boros player's turn and let's see if they want to carry on chipping away at us. Alright, going in at Gogo -Go instead of us. Uh, they will draw a card with a Kiri, ramp with the Sword of the Animist. Getting through pretty unscathed from the Akiri player's turn. At the end of their turn, the Burnished Heart getting sacrificed for a couple of basics. And Coma does trigger during every upkeep for anyone who doesn't know, so every upkeep we will give some life to the Soul Sisters over here. Then during their turn, they have the Orzov Signet come into play, seven cards in hand still, thanks to all the extra card draw from Gogo. -Go. And then it's Regna the Redeemer, so they are going to get the two tokens here, thanks to all the life gain, and that does trigger during every end step I think. Yeah, the beginning of each end step, so our coma is going to trigger their uh, their soul sisters during every turn, which is going to trigger the regna during each end step, so yeah, you're welcome opponents. We are getting chipped away by the suture priest as well, by the way, because it does ping us every time a creature comes into play. And then temple bell being activated by Gogo. -Go. Looks like he might be getting down his commander here. Nope, that is Sahili's Artistry making a copy of the Dockside Extortionist and making a copy of Font of Mythos as well. And Brofisto going for Chaos Warp. I don't know if I would have bothered with that, but going with Chaos Warp onto the Dockside Extortionist, maybe I'll get into something really good here. Could kill two birds with one stone. Uh, gets himself into a Mox Opal, so a little bit of extra mana. He does have Metal Craft. Gogo -Go still gets a copy of the Font of Mythos though, so we're all going to be drawing a hell of a lot of cards. I think I'll hopefully try and survive until we've got Lethal with the Serpent of Yawning Depths. Uh, yeah, and then I'll probably have to go at the Akiri player thanks to this. And Regna, as ever, has gained life this turn, so the Warriors will come into play. I think it might be time to get rid of the Suture Priest with the Pongify. Not only will it gain them less life, but it'll stop pinging us, because we're going to take a damage every turn to the Coma's coils. So, in response to Coma's trigger, let's go for the Pongify on there. They'll gain a life from the Soul Warden, because they will get a 3-3 Ape token. Okay, Sylvan Library don't think we need, because we're drawing plenty of cards. Scourge of Fleets. Uh, where X... Is the number of islands you control. Uh, Whelming Wave is probably good to go for because we've obviously just got Serpents and Leviathans and Krakens and stuff. This is a Sea Creatures deck if that wasn't obvious. So let's get our island count as high as we possibly can ready for the Scourge of Fleets a little bit later on. Uh, we'll go Elemental Bond here then we can carry on drawing cards whenever a Coma's Coil comes into play. Priority being held up over here, so we might be able to get a Swords to Plowshares or something out of their hand. Let's just turn in sideways at Rolfisto. Could also have Teferi's Protection as well. But either way, he can get his Commander through, whether we hold back blockers or not. And I would like to clean up this board over here. So let's go for the Whelming Wave. And priority still being held by Rolfisto. And that lands, that's really good. They don't have any haste yet, so... Yeah, that's really, really good for us. We will pass the turn at that. And I think we can get rid of a land and Sylvan Library. And whenever the Comas Coil enters, it does have three power, so triggers the Elemental Bond. We draw into Traverse the Outlands. Elemental Bond is an auto-include in Coma, as far as I'm concerned. Really easy way to keep yourself in cards. <laughs> And I never thought of that, Koma Kai. If any of you have not watched Cobra Kai, then it's a necessity, you have to watch it. Really good. Not worthy that Emiria the Sky Ruin is only a couple of turns away, or a couple of planes away from being triggered. And Akiri, nearly said Akira then, Akiri coming back into play and hard equipping the Commander's Plate. 
Maybe should have, instead of going for the elemental bond, maybe should have gone for bounce and everything and then held up reality shift for the Akiri so that it couldn't be equipped with the protection from blue, but I'm just hoping we can slam this down and get rid of Brofisto. Also could have tapped this down in response to it getting equipped by um, sacrificing a coma's coil, so maybe should have done that as well. But if we're planning on having all of our stuff be unblockable, then I suppose we need as many serpents in play as possible. Another token enters, this time we get into Simic Signet. Well, there's the path to exile. Uh, we'll be able to search for a basic... Maybe still go for Serpent of Yawning Tide, is it called? Yawning Depths. Uh, that'll be 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 and 18. Maybe we'll be able to get into some haste for the Serpent. Anyway, nothing we can do about that, so we will allow it. And we'll up our island count. Alright, well, so much for that. A Fumigate destroying all of the Comas Coils. They had to get rid of our commander before doing that because it would have been indestructible. So our comms coils go down, but the Akiri can detach an equipment and gain indestructible. So that opens us up for the reality shift onto Akiri at least. Then a Felwar Stone. 11 cards in hand for Mango. But no one has an infinite hand size as of yet. And there's that Soul Warden again after we threw it back to their hand with the bounce. A <laughs> Serra Ascendant as well, excellent. So it might be that we have to go Reality Shift onto that, unfortunately. Now it's round to Gogo's turn, who is just pretty much here to keep us all in cards by the looks of it. Draws us into a Mana Drain with the Temple Bell. Doesn't actually have all of his colours yet, somehow. Clever Impersonator. I would imagine that would go on the Serra Ascendant. Nope, going on the Font of Mythos. And there is a Sculpting Steel which can come down as a copy of any artefact and no prizes for guessing what he's going to copy. So that is four Font of Mythos in play. We're going to have to be very careful not to get decked out here. We're all at roughly the early 70s in our library. So we draw into a bunch of lands. There's Great Henge, uh, the Kiora, Master of the Depths. Uh, we've got a Mana Doubler as well. So we're managing to make a bunch of islands at least. If we go for our coma now, we'll only have two mana left over. Which could either be for reality shift or the mana drain to protect it. I think it might have to be coma. And then maybe we just take a hit in the air from the Serra if we go for reality shift onto Akiri. I think either way, in order to make this hand work, we need a big creature in play. So we might as well go Wild Growth onto the forest, because that pretty much pays for itself. And priority has been held up by Brofisto, so we might have to counter a Swords or something. Yeah, so not the best position for us to be in, but we'll try our luck. I think the Boros player has something for us, but we'll force them to use it at least. Draw a card with the Elemental Bond and gain the Soul Sister a bit of life. And then during the end step, tapping down a single piece, a couple of pieces of white mana, three pieces, so maybe Generous Gift. Uh, no, playing Sword of Fire and Ice at instant speed, which will give it protection from blue. I think we just need to get rid of Akiri here. So a Manifest Creature enters the battlefield and triggers the Soul Warden again. Yeah, again, we'll probably take a hit from the Serra Ascendant, but you never know, they might not come in towards us. Probably should have waited for the sword to enter the battlefield as well and get targeted onto the Akiri and then manifested because as it happens now they can actually equip it for free onto the manifest creature. So discarding a bunch of stuff down to hand size, a bunch of mana, ramp, um, card draw like risk cards expertise. Don't think we'll have chance to cast the Kiora or the Icy. Uh, yeah, the plan really is to try and keep our coma in play. And then we can try and take someone out with Serpent of Yawning Depths. Maybe get a bunch of lands into play with Traverse the Outlands. I'd like two big creatures in play before I go for this, in case coma gets shot in response. Pretty bad matchup for us, having a bunch of white players at the table. They have the best spot removal in the game for creatures. Okay, yeah, Mango requesting that the Soul Sister does not get shocked. We'll see what happens. A Soul Ring for the Boros player. Followed by more Fast Manor in Chrome Mox. 13 cards in hand, so it shouldn't be an issue with the Moxons. <laughs> then a Stoneforge Mystic, so 
Yeah, we might see some kind of double strike here. It was a big mistake that I allowed this to get equipped up. Because they effectively don't need haste here. But if we manage to get a bunch of islands down with this, we might be able to just bounce everything back with Scourge of Fleets. I don't know if we're going to have enough mana for that or not. We do have a Mana Vault in hand now from this turn. And the Elemental Bond. Red Elemental Blast will force us to sacrifice. So we'll get rid of a Coma's Coil to make that indestructible. They might have something else for it, thanks to all the card draw. But it does gain indestructible. Glad to see the back of that while we've got a Mana Drain in hand though. Then Arcane Signet with 10 cards left in hand. And now a Relic Seeker. They still don't have haste, I don't think. I'm not sure. Oh, they went for the Swiftfoot Boots with the Stoneforge Mystic before. Oh, and of course it's only 2 mana because it gets equipped for free, thanks to the Sagada's Aid. So the 4-4 coming in at us as we assumed it would. The 2-2 two -two goes in at Go-Go as we assumed it would. And now we'll see if they shock the Soul Warden or not. Tapping out into something, it might be a bunch of damage, a big buff onto this maybe. Uh, that could be the Nezahan's Hammer or whatever it's called, the Indestructible one. And uh, Well, it's a hammer but it's not the one I was thinking it was, Colossus Hammer. So they're going to deal 14 to us. Yeah, so really hurt by the fact that we allowed that to get equipped up. I think they could have done something similar to this anyway because they've got mana held up. They could have just paid the two and put it onto here. Uh, plus they ended up with haste anyway, so yeah. Our only means of getting out of this really would be the Scourge of Fleets, but we need to get a bunch of islands into play before then. And I think we got shocked by the sword there as well. It did not go on the Soul Warden. And then that becomes renowned so they can search for another equipment. So it looks as though Mango is likely going to take us out with the 6-6 Flyer here. Yeah, I wanted to build Coma like outside of a typical um, Good Stuff Simic deck. I wanted to make it like Sea Serpent, Sea Monsters Tribal, but I think Coma's so scary a commander that we're just not going to have chance to uh, play out a bunch of fun sea creatures and stuff. So I might have to make a different coma list that actually is going to be able to get us into the late game, which is what we typically want to do with coma. Ajani's welcome for some more life game whenever a creature enters under their control. <laughs> then an Archangel of Thune start putting a bunch of plus counters on all their stuff. So whenever a creature enters as it stands now, they will get two plus counters on everything. Yeah, I think the shock definitely should have gone on the Soul Warden. It's all well and good knowing that we might be the biggest threat at the table, but it doesn't mean that you <laughs> allow a bunch of life gain to take place, and we're starting to see the benefits of it now. It is actually out of the shock range. And now a Death Greeter, so whenever a creature of theirs dies, they'll gain life there as well. And it's a bunch more counters here. They might be able to make the Soul Warden big enough to swing into us, because obviously we can tap this down with the Coma. Uh... But if they're going to force us to trade the coma, then... Yeah, we're still in pretty dire straits here. A couple of plus counters on all their stuff per creature that enters. Now, an indulging patrician. Uh, that is, each opponent loses three life, so we'll be at one at that point. So the Soul Warden is going to be big enough to take out our coma. And we're not going to be able to give it indestructible because the Serra Ascendant would have been tapped down. Okay, Swords to Plowshares going on to the Coma's Coil. So we'll tap down the Serra Ascendant so they don't gain quite as much life. And, oh, it's whenever a creature dies with Death Greeter, so that will trigger. Because our Coma's Coil died, and we will tap down the Serra Ascendant. It loses all abilities, and the Soul Warden swings in towards us, as you would expect. So we will block and lose our Coma. Which triggers the Death Greeter. Now finally, making it over to Gogo's turn, he will draw a heap of cards from the Font of Mythos. Surprising that we're all still north of 60 cards in hand. Talisman of Impulse. Shocking in a Steam Vents. Then a Thief's Auction, exile all non-token permanents. Starting with you, each player chooses one of the exile cards and puts it onto the battlefield tapped under their control. Repeat the process until all cards exiled this way have been chosen. This is going to take a while. Yeah, 
This is going to take a stupidly long time because it does the lands as well. Ugh. So I'm going to take the Soul Warden here. Ready for when all these creatures enter play. That might be the only thing that can keep us in play here. Okay, so the Archangel of Thune comes into play and we are already gaining some life. Clever Impersonator comes down as an Archangel of Thune. I'll get down the uh, Indulging Patrician as well because we might be able to go for the Colossus Hammer or whatever it's called over here. That thing does have lifelink. And they go for their Swiftfoot Boots. No point in going for the Serret Ascendant because we're only at one life. It wouldn't be a 6-6 six, six with flying. Uh, they got their original Font of Mythos. They'd already kept the token. Let's get the Colossus Hammer. Uh, that is 8 to equip. So we'll probably be able to equip it next turn and gain a bit of life. Whether we'll be able to survive past that is anyone's guess. We'll take the Commander's Plate from the Boros player as well, just so that it's a bit less protection from them. They get a Stoneforge Mystic into play, which will allow them to tutor Ajani's Welcome over here. Looks like the lands are building up over here. Uh, I think it's time that we started making mana ourselves. Let's take the Sol Ring. Swiftfoot Boots. Uh, Chrome Mox Swiftfoot Boots is here. Uh, I think at this point I'll just let it cycle through everything and we'll go over what everyone has after the fact. Yeah, we've had a few of our lands stolen here, so... Uh, yeah. Seems as though Gogo is going after our lands. So maybe we start stealing our opponent's lands. Okay, so all that is finally done. We get our Soul Warden triggers because we got it out really early. Uh, Chrome Mox, Stoneforge Mystic go on the stack, some life being gained over here from the Ajani's Welcome. We'll put counters on everything with Archangel of Thune. And we've all swapped lands. Uh, yeah, someone kept... Yeah, Gogo's taken some of our um, islands there. Our Ancient Tomb has been taken, so our lands aren't the best. I wasn't taking anyone else's lands until they started taking ours. So all the land swaps around, we're pretty much staying within the same colours though, for obvious reasons. Don't think there's really too much else to go over really. Sword of Fire and Ice is over here, which is relevant. Uh, so is Sagada's Aid and the Swiftfoot Boots. Some life gain stuff still over here and a copy of the Archangel of Thune in this direction. And there is still a Font of Mythos, a Temple Bell and a copy of the Font of Mythos. And it's our turn next. Go, go, having to discard down to hand size because he is at 14 cards in hand and everyone is tapped out. So we end up at 8 life, which is much better than 1. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to gain a nice chunk of life this turn. A little bit too late to be seeing Sakura Tribe Elder. Temple of the False God isn't terrible though. This is a card that I always tell everyone is pretty undeserving of all the hate that it gets. Everyone says how terrible this card is and the vast majority of times, like 99% of the times that I play it, it's not as terrible as people make it out to be. So I think we go for Mana Vault here. Tap down the mana that we're not going to make use of the colours with. Put that onto the Indulging Patrician. And still no haste for us, unfortunately. Uh, the uh, Great Henge is free. So we'll get that down. Cost two mana and it taps for two mana. The island count has been really bad this game, so Scourge of Fleets isn't anywhere near as good as I would have liked. We were kept off the Traverse the Outlands one turn when our coma was blown up, so... I think we can just get down Temple of the False God here. And I suppose we might as well just equip up the Commander's equipment. Put that on there, that is five mana. So we'll hit this player for 14, they'll lose 3, thanks to the Indulging Patrician. And I think we're just holding up the Mana Drain at this point. Try and stay in the game as long as we can. Uh, he's gone for Sword of Feast and Famine, by the way, which will probably eat a counter spell. So we knock Bro Fisto down to 6. And then he'll go down to 3 from the activation, or the trigger even. Uh, yeah, I think we just leave it there. And now our opponents have to be careful, is it? 
if we gain three or more life, yeah, if we gain three or more life during a turn, then Bro Fisto is going to go down, assuming that he can't gain any life. Not worthy that. They could get around the counter magic with Sword of Feast and Famine by activating the Stoneforge Mystic. We won't be able to counter it because it's an ability. But with all those cards in hand, we really don't want them to have the Sword of Feast and Famine, so I'm going to be forced to counter this here. It might be that they have another red counter spell. But no, nope, managing to get rid of that, that's really good. They could have Sun Titan or any means of getting that out of the bin. There is a Sword of War and Peace, which has protection from white, so they can get straight through to us with that. And we do have six cards in hand. So if these two continue to gang up on us, they might get rid of us yet. I make that out to be 14 damage on us if they shock us as well. Uh, Shadow Spear will give it a slight buff as well, and they're likely to equip that because they do need to gain the life. They'll gain life from the Sword of War and Peace as well. Uh, that is life equal to the number of cards in their hand. Surprisingly, putting the Shadow Spear onto their Stoneforge Mystic. Okay, so... There is some politicking going on here. Uh, yeah, Gogo saying that he can't win. Mango is annoyed at that Chaos card, so wants to take him out. Yeah, telling him to kill the Soul Warden. And not hit Gogo, so yeah, whatever. I'll just leave him to it. <laughs> I've never been one for politicking. It's, uh, yeah, it's not really my thing. I'd rather just let people make their own decisions. Plus it takes away from my concentration of the game and the commentary. So that swings in at us, as you would expect. And then the Stoneforge getting tapped in response. And they're putting an equipment into play. Going down to one in order to do it, thanks to stealing our ancient tomb. And they throw down a grafted exoskeleton, so that is probably... Infect damage? Can they do that? No, I don't think they've got enough. Oh, and anyway, deciding to not equip it for whatever reason. It was pointed at the Stoneforge Mystic, but decided against equipping that. So anyway, we get hit by the Relic Seeker. They'll be able to search for another equipment when this hits us. So the Sword Triggers go on the stack. Mango was instructing Bro Fisto to shoot the Soul Warden, and he is doing as he's told. So it might be that Mango can reanimate the Soul Warden and do a bunch of life gain stuff. Renown gets them into Hammer of Nazan, and they'll draw a card from the Fire and Ice as well as shoot the Soul Warden. Death Greeter will gain them a life because a creature died, which triggers the Archangel of Thune. And then Sword of War and Peace will gain them 9 life because they now have 9 cards in hand, it will lose us 6 life. So we go down to 12, so it might be that this thing can get us next turn. Now Cathar's Crusade from the Orzhov player, 10 cards in hand. So a bunch of plus counters going to be distributed here by the looks of it. <laughs> and there is a Grave Titan. So no wonder they wanted rid of the Soul Warden, we would gain a bunch of life to the Grave Titan. Or, well, 3 life at least. They gain life from every creature that enters, from the Ajani's Welcome, puts plus counters all over everything with Archangel of Thune. And then the Cathar's Crusade puts plus counters on everything as well. So the 1414 Serra Ascendant swings in at us to take us out. And uh, yeah, those two take out Gogo, so two players going down, that's really good. Get this game over and done with. So there we are, both going down. Now we'll see if the equipments player can get rid of Mango, who is at 106 life now. There is Infect at the table, don't forget. Doesn't have protection from black, thanks to us getting rid of the Sword of Feast and Famine, but he does have Trample with the Shadow Spear. Oh, and someone just pointed out in the chat that the Sigarda's Aid is what targets the creature to put the Grafted Exoskeleton onto it, so yeah, I didn't realise that's how it worked. That's why the Exoskeleton didn't go onto there previously, because it is actually the Sigarda's Aid that targets it. Anyway, an Armoured Sky Hunter coming into play. And then Hammer of Nazan going on to that. Uh, the Grave Titan is a 14-14 Death Toucher. The zombies are 10-10s at the moment. Don't think I've ever seen an Archangel of Thune stay in play for so long. Whenever I play it, it gets blown up immediately. But it's done a hell of a lot of work here. Really waiting for the Thalisa to come out on Magic Online. We don't have any of the Commander 2021 cards, believe it or not. Otherwise, I would have been straight on those. 
especially Thalisa, because I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, haste and Hexproof going on to the Sky Hunter. And it's not looking like Brawfisto is going to be able to do anything. The Grafted Exoskeleton as well doesn't quite do it. Pretty sure that Mango's going wide next turn. Just deciding to turn everything in sideways. Uh, the Armoured Sky Hunter did trigger there, but I don't think they got anything. If I look at the revealed zone, yeah, I don't think they pulled anything out of the top six. So just jump in with a zombie, taking seven poison damage and staying at 106. So now it's round to Mango's turn. All he really has to do here is turn sideways and the game can be over, but he is casting something here. Uh, Heliod's intervention. Okay, so he went up to 127. Uh, and then, yep, just turning sideways, he goes wide on Brofisto quite comfortably. So I'm sure that the Shadow Spear would have gone on to the big creature had this have been able to target it. Uh, that's just a little numbo that I didn't know about either, so protection from white is pretty risky when you've got a Sagada's Aid in the list. So just something for everyone to be wary of. So a bunch of stuff turns in sideways, they gain some more life from the zombies entering. And there we go, finally, that one's over. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm probably going to have to retire the Coma um, Sea Creatures deck. I don't know how well it would have fared against these decks if there wasn't a group hug player at the table. The one advantage that a more controlly wanting to bounce creatures and buy yourself time type deck has over the more aggro builds is that they're likely to run out of cards way before you are. But when you've got a group hug player feeding everyone cards, they've got the advantage of speed and having a bunch of cards in hand. Whereas we've just got big dumb sea monsters, so... Uh, I might make another coma list, but one that is just a Simic Value, your typical Simic Value deck. Be sure to let me know what you all think of that idea. Big thank you to my patrons, Bro Fisto, Mango and Gogo Batman. This channel wouldn't be possible without them. There's no way that Magic Online randoms would sit through all that. Big thank you to them again. I'm Travel Kai on the EDH channel. Thank you for watching.